For ways that you can support the people of Ukraine, please check the show notes. We've included some links to organizations which are helping refugees, providing medical aid, supporting the Ukrainian military, or covering the war. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian Literature for the Inebriated. I'm Matt Garasimovich, a PhD student in Russian Lit. This week, attending my first uh, academic conference, Ooh. Uh, basically the equivalent of a podcast in real life. <laughs> you should tell them that. I'm going to. They're going to love it. <laughs> well, that's exciting. I'm Cameron Lalana, and um, so... There was a scheduling mishap, and we got I got a three day weekend for my job uh, for President's Day weekend, um, and I was going to use that time to be productive. We do technically have like three episodes in, that we've recorded that I still need to edit, uh, and I was going to do that. But then I started playing an indie game my friend gave me like a couple months back, and I played that for fifteen straight hours yesterday. So, yes, sir, uh, off to a, a great start so far. <laughs> yeah, I started playing Red Dead Redemption two recently, so like I can't even I can't <laughs> even take the high ground here on time spent playing games yeah well you know at least we're balancing it out with some good uh dostoevsky content in a way <laughs> in a way this is a podcast where me and my good pal cameron get to unwind from our weeks with some russian literature and a drink or two this week we're talking about part four of crime and punishment where it is all about the extended dialogue baby this is this part of crime and punishment it feels like reading a play where there is very little action it's just chapters and chapters of conversation which i, I know thinking, like a lot of crime and punishment oh is tr- conversation God. but <laughs> there was a part in this where where Raskolnikov was like yes and remember last night how this happened that i was like that was last night so much has <laughs> been written yet not happened <laughs> <laughs> oh and we will get into that uh before we go into the extended dialogues matt what are you drinking today uh the, today i'm drinking a real beer uh, I'm drinking Ooh, okay. the, the limited edition pastrami on rye from Pipeworks Brewing Ooh. here in Chicago. It's the Manny's Deli edition uh, pastrami on rye, which is a rye ale with smoked malt, brown sugar, black pepper, coriander seed, red pepper, and mustard seed. And it is a weird taste to have in my mouth. I Yeah, I think I, I told you this before, but it really feels much more like a dill pickle uh, spice mix rather than a beer. But I, I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> it's fine drinking it that's fair that's fair yeah i mean you know beer does the body good so hey (laughs) it's beer that's a it's a it's a great endorsement i mean yeah (laughs) (laughs) what are you drinking today i've got two things so i'm trying to stay on brand and find something related to the text to drink uh okay kiss up (laughs) (laughs) this is a dry one the only the only reference to any drinks whatsoever was i think Porfiry inviting Dostoy Raskolnikov to have some coffee with him. Uh, so I am I, I I have a cup of coffee which I poured whiskey into. Uh, yes, it is currently seven twenty one in the evening. I have no idea when I'm going to go to bed. But in addition to that, as a real beer, I finally got uh, many episodes back. I, I mentioned that my sister very nicely got me some beers for Christmas, so I finally have uh, uh, gotten those, and I am drinking the Sierra Nevada 2022 Bigfoot Barley Wine style ale which I'm very excited about because I've not had barley wine in a long time. And Bigfoot and I have quite the history. I'm not going to prod that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, you shouldn't. We'd, we'd be here for too long. Explaining. You're going to have to tune into a bonus episode in the future if you want to hear about Cameron's <laughs> uh, relationship with Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get into today's episode and before we get into Bigfoot content, We just want to remind everyone that if you read along with us during our Crime and Punishment series, you can grab a copy of the book through our affiliate links on our website. And you can consider becoming a Patreon to join our monthly reading group. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to early episodes, join our reading group, like we mentioned, and have a say in what we read next. If you're not interested in Patreon but still want to help us out, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. Cameron, come here come here mm, yes i got some okay yeah i just i don't i, I wanted to tell you just because i think this okay. was good that you brought it up but i didn't i wouldn't want to yeah. tell everybody all at once just 
Ooh. You know how we have like a lot of those extended series coming up where we're going to be reading a lot of really great Russian literature books? Sure, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, allegedly. Yeah. But I... now, now is probably the best time in the world to become a patron of the podcast, so I would highly recommend if anyone's overhearing this conversation that they should they should right now at this instant become a patron i mean it's a pretty private conversation but yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. okay i'll back i'll back yeah. away now i'm okay. too close yeah, okay. <laughs> i'm glad you brushed your teeth today it was good yeah it was um, good, it was good. <laughs> can you smell my pastrami and rye <laughs> <laughs> it's so strong that it's that it's crossing state borders <laughs> to, to come to my very non-functioning nose heck yeah all right podcast podcast uh, podcast so let's talk about part four of Crime and Punishment. So this part truly is just a, a, a series of dialogues with Raskolnikov talking to different people. Not in a bad way. Um, I, I actually, I quite, I, I quite enjoyed it. It's, it's good. It's really good setup. Um, unfortunately, to, to a certain degree, it is set up. It is setting up what's coming next, uh, largely in part five and part six. Uh, but there's still a lot of things to note here as we're heading into those parts. You know how in like, was it last episode or the episode before mm. I talked about the role of coincidence in crime and punishment. I mean, yeah, I talked about it, but I also took it from an article that I had read. Um, <laughs> this to me, it's like the dialogue of coincidence. Interesting. A lot of the stuff that happens here is like, what are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> well, for some of them, for some of the characters, it's quite intentional. So low odds, but you know, they were really, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get into that. So as you might remember, as we left off last time, Raskolnikov woke up and there was a strange man in his room, which is a situation you don't ideally want to be in. No. Uh, in this case, it is Svidrigailov, which is actually far worse than it being an unknown man, because it being an unknown man at least leaves the door open for it being a good person. Um, so <laughs> Raskolnikov, upon hearing that this is Svidrigailov, basically is like, why are you here? No, get the hell out of my room. In Svidrigailov basically says, hey, I'm here to talk to you about my life story and monologues that Raskolnikov about his perspective on his wife's death and how he's really not even responsible for his wife's death. I mean, you can't even prove it. And he barely even whipped her that day. And really, he didn't even whip her that much overall. And how he thought he's, he keeps thinking he sees her as a ghost. There's a very casual conversation where he's like, yeah, my wife's ghost is following me around. He talks about uh, asking Raskolnikov to see his perspective on on him trying to force Dunya into a relationship where it's it's really about you know it's it's really an expression of how much you know how much he was in love and you only to assume that I too am a man et nihil humanum uh, in a word that I am capable of being attracted and falling in love which does not depend on our will then everything can be explained in the most natural manner the question is am I a monster or am I self a victim um, and the resounding answer is yes, he is definitely a monster, but that's beside the point. Uh, <laughs> talks about his history of, uh, with Marfa Petrovna, his late wife, uh, how she had bailed him out of debt seven years ago because she was in love with him and was way worse off for that doing that. Most of his estate is, is all her money. But now that she's dead, she's left basically all of that estate to their children. And in addition, he knows uh, about 3,000 rubles have been left to Dunya. Um, so he's just, he left his children with, with, uh, with Marfa's sister and is just palling about Petersburg now after going to Moscow for a bit. And he tells Raskolnikov the reason he's here is because he's going to get Dunya out of her marriage delusion. And he says to him, look, I, I'm not here. I mean, when I was in Moscow, I thought maybe I was going to try to get back together with Dunya or get together with Dunya. But I've come here and decided, no, I'm here for morally good purposes. And I know Lusion is not a good dude. So I'm, I'm going to get her out. I'm going to give you give her 10,000 rubles. So she can start her own life without him. And I'm, I promise this isn't because I've got my designs on Dunya. Uh, and in fact, I'm actually planning to marry someone soon. Uh, who? It doesn't matter. I'll just I'll just marry someone else. So there's <laughs> so it alleviates suspicion, which is top notch covering. Um, and then Raskolnikov says, I'm obviously not going to tell Dunya about this plan. Uh, uh, Svetogrylov says, well, if you don't tell her, I will. So... <laughs> And Raskolnikov is like, if I do tell her, will you not meet her? And Svetogrylov is like, mm, no promises. Anyway, bye. <laughs> and shows himself out. I think uh, in, the, in the universe, if we were to apply like modern job criteria to what each of the characters do, I think mm. Luzhin would probably be a consultant. But I think Svetogrylov <laughs> would be mm, d d not someone who holds a consistent job, but someone who's mm. consistently trying to dupe their friends into some sort of like crypto scam. <laughs> <laughs> something about him i feel like svidrig i love would be like a traditional salesman who's trying to get mm -hmm. into like the newfangled stuff so he's like trying to get everyone into crypto mm -hmm. but he doesn't really know him that much about it himself mm -hmm. 
but he's like he's using a lot of like very traditional methods to sell people on in the u.s come a couple of questions and it becomes really apparent that he has no idea what he's talking about yeah but there are ghosts involved somehow yeah but there are ghosts involved which is yeah well maybe we'll come back to that one so i really don't know i'd love to tell you if we could <laughs> but i don't know <laughs> yes yeah, so we were trying to find or at least matt was trying to find scholarship on the ghost thing but if it exists, we didn't come across it. So if you happen to know of something, someone writing about it, please send it to us. If because you that's... or your family have seen the, the ghost <laughs> that has been haunting Spidrick I love, please contact this podcast immediately. <laughs> uh, well, so after the after not maybe meeting ghosts, uh, Raskolnikov goes to meet Rosamikin, uh, so they can go all go out to dinner with Dunya and Pulcheria uh, to talk with Illusion, who very explicitly did not want. Uh, Raskolnikov and probably implicitly didn't want Razumikhin coming to that meeting either, but he didn't explicitly say anything about Razumikhin, so really that one's on him. <laughs> Fool. <laughs> Lucian arrives and is obviously a bit off-put that the other two are there, but he's kind of going along with it. They're kind of having some awkward dinner conversation. Out of nowhere, getting to the what you mentioned about uh, conversational, um, uh, what's the word? Conversational coincidences. Uh, Lucian brings up that he notes that uh, Svedrogailov has come to Petersburg. And he ends up relating, you know, like, oh, I know how ba- how hard that was for you. And in fact, uh, you, you you didn't know this, but uh, it, it said that Marfa actually covered up for some barbarity, some murderous brutality on his part. And everyone is kind of like, what are you talking about? And he says, well, this is all hearsay, technically. But some number of years, Mac, there was this, 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 a person here, Madame Resslich, who is a German immigrant. And she has a niece who she didn't much like. And one day her niece is found to have been to a, to a what the officials say to have hung herself but uh, as it comes out in the course of the investigation the the child had been quote cruelly outraged by Svidrigailov a fact that was basically hushed up hushed up uh, by Marfa's influence and money uh so with that on the table Raskolnikov takes this incredible moment to say actually I saw Svidrigailov today and he's coming by to make Dunya an offer of some sort and then Lujan says what are you talking about and Raskolnikov's like don't worry about it we'll chat about it later Dunya at this point, Raskolnikov also mentions that Marfa uh, left Dunya about three thousand dollars, three three thousand rubles. Uh, Lucian, at this point, is like, you know what? If you're going to keep secrets from me, I don't even want to be here. And Dunya says, "Look, man, I, you're mad at my brother. My brother's mad at you. If I'm going to marry you, there's got to be like peace in the family. You and my brother have to get along. So either you've got to apologize to him, or he's got to apologize to you. Whatever the case may be." And then Lucian hits back with an absolutely stunning, no, you have to love me more than your family. To which Dunya says, I simply do not, especially now that I have financial stability, and tells him to get out. <laughs> and he tries to argue his way back into their good graces, which is, even, I, mean, I this, actually, this one was, like, very funny, because I, just, I, yeah, you know, I'm tangentially, I'm familiar with people who have tried to, like, argue with, like, their recent exes back into dating them, and not that that's ever funny, but it's, Really spot on by Dostoevsky here in ways that I'm not even sure he knew. <laughs> he knew. I like when Razumikin says, please leave or I will literally crack your skull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what finally gets him to leave is like Razumikin is like, he's going to put all that ham power into into work, which is probably, probably kill Lucian in like one punch if we're going to be honest. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he takes off and <laughs> as he goes outside, he's he's still thinking he can salvage this situation. He's like, look, I, I, I know it's all because of Raskolnikov this is happening. And he kind of reflects on, you know, I, everything was going so well until Raskolnikov got involved. You know, sure. I've worked so hard and all I want is this just like a simple thing. I just want to marry. I just want to marry a woman who who vibes with me. I just want a woman who is, quote, virtuous, poor. She must be poor. Very, very pretty. Well born and well educated. Very timid. One who has suffered much and was completely humbled before him. One who would all her life look on him as her savior, worship him, admire him and only him. So like a pretty simple list. Not much. Just like standard stuff. Yeah, pretty much, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he thinks I'm gonna tomorrow morning. I'm gonna get rid of the effects of Raskolnikov and get my virtuous, poor, very pretty, well-educated, well-born, very timid, you know, savior complex having uh, a fiance back into good graces with me. Meanwhile, back in the room, everyone is relentlessly clowning on him. Dunya is like, I got, we, we, we are financially stable now. I don't even have to do this anymore. I'm happy. Even Pulcheria is like, oh, I'm glad that we've told him off. That's the last we'll ever see of him. A spoiler alert, it's not. Uh, so as they're celebrating, like, uh, Razumikin being Razumikin immediately thinks of like, oh, hey, okay, my uncle offered to loan me some money and you've got money now. So what if we started a publishing house and goes off on that? Boom. And <laughs> I relate to this passage specifically. 
<laughs> this is my business venture. I try and start with any friend that will have me. <laughs> and before you know it, you're like 40 something episodes of a podcast into it. <laughs> 40 something. We're, we're just about 50 something episodes into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a scheme, really, at this point. It's a long term commitment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you say scheme i say long-term commitment it's basically the same thing mm-hmm. yeah um so they're they're all having having this great conversation and then uh raskolnikov decides to take off and when i say like he like very suddenly decides to take off i mean like mid-sentence it goes from i think either dunya or, or Razumikin talking being like hey wait where are you going raskolnikov <laughs> <laughs> and he's like hey guys i'm gonna peace out i'll pray back maybe if not resume can take care of my family bye Obviously, Razumikin chases after him and is like, yo, what's up? And Raskolnikov is just like, don't worry about it. Probably I'm going to be back in the next couple of days, but look after my mother and sister. And then in a bit of uh, foreshadowing, Razumikin goes back and lies to uh, the Raskolnikovs. And it's noted that after that day, he became like a son and brother to them. Not foreshadowing anything or anything like that. No, no, certainly not. <laughs> so after this point, Raskolnikov walks off to go see Sonia, uh, like he told her he would, I think, the day before... Or the day, I, very, very recently in part three, when he tells her, I'm going to come see you soon, he finally comes up to, to go visit her place that she's uh, she's renting. He, he walks in, they chat briefly, and then he begins to look around the place. And when I say he's looking around the place, normally in books, you, you have a character walk into a room and they, they describe the room and you just kind of assume that, oh, this is like in universe, they're just glancing around. This is just the author conveying to you what kind of like place you're in. No, not in this book. When this book, when, when when we're going over every detail, it is explicit that Raskolnikov is just standing there surveilling the, the place. Not only that, but other characters literally notice the fact that he's standing there inspecting what's happening. Yeah, I know. That's what I was saying. Is like Sonia's feeling really awkward because she's just standing there watching him scan her apartment. <laughs> not, none of this is subtext. This is the text of the book, which is very, very funny to me. So Sonia... After Raskolnikov has finished scanning her apartment into his memory, uh, tries to talk to him about her feelings, uh, noting that she keeps thinking she sees her father walking around the city, or how she feels just awful that the last time she really saw her parents was uh, last week, and she was kind of mean to them at that point, that she wouldn't read to her father, uh, she refused a gift for uh, for her mother, Katerina, and is just like, I wish I could take that back, because now that's going to be the last memory i have of us all together that's going to be the last time we were all together of me being you know willfully mean to them because i'm just i'm so tired and you know under under so much stress raskolnikov does not care about this or begins to harangue at her basically just tells her that she should kill herself like right out the gate uh he just was like man you live such an awful terrible life why don't you just drown yourself he's like you know katerina ivanovna now she doesn't have really much more money she's pretty much just leeching off of you uh, she's very consumptive. She's obviously got tuberculosis, and it's going to get worse, and she's going to die soon. And the children are going to go to the poorhouse. And frankly, uh, your kid sister, uh, Polenka, is probably also going to have to go into to prostitution like you. And also, did, did your mother, did Katerina Ivanovna beat you pretty often? Uh, all, through all which, Sonia is like, no, Katerina Ivanovna didn't beat me. No, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, Palenka is going to go into take up the yellow card, go into prostitution. Uh, I, you know, a good God wouldn't allow those things to happen. It's just, just, just great conversations from from very good people. Well, one half good people. I don't um, think it, it's not because so. he he wants her to commit suicide. I think it's he's projecting his own kind of thoughts and insecurities onto her in the in the sense because yes. I think he's thinking about it or has of course thought about it. But there was that scene where uh, that one girl like jumped off the bridge and tried to drown herself and did not succeed ultimately. And I feel like he was kind of, I, there was something like distasteful or like off putting about that. And he's trying to work out why that is because you could mm. legitimately say, okay, here's like, you could say that's a solution for his current predicament that he's in. And clearly that's something that he's thought about. And I feel like he's trying to work out like why that's not, you know, the path he's taking. Yeah. No. I, yeah. You're correct. And that he, what he's really doing is he's, looking at her life and, and saying objectively it, it sucks it's not great yeah. you obviously you have been forced into prostitution by circumstances you obviously this is obviously taking a heavy toll on you your father's dead uh your mother who is like your last connection to this world who you obviously care about a great deal her mother and her her siblings um they're probably you know their uh, odds are not great for them 
you know, why don't you just drown yourself? And as she keep basic, he keeps basically saying to him, uh, no, I, I, I refuse to give in. He says to himself, is she in her senses? Can people talk? Can people reason as she does? How can she listen when she is told about the dangers which face her? Does she expect a miracle? No doubt she does. Doesn't that all mean madness? He looked obstinately at that thought. In fact, he liked that explanation better than any other. He began looking more intently at her, before later noting, uh, discussing more with her about her religious affiliations, and he says, oh, she's a religious maniac, which is him working through, as you put out her thoughts, and sorry, I think I interrupted you there. No, you're, I think this is like an extension of his environmental arguing. In the, This is the, the extreme, if you were to take the logical reasoning of uh, people who argue that the, the environment will dictate individual actions if it is the case that people towards the bottom of society have you know the worst environmental conditions why is it not the case that suicides don't exclusively happen at the bottom of society i feel like that's what this is like trying to explore a little bit Mm. it's obviously not my like not my personal opinion but i think it's i think it's interesting i think there's a lot here yeah yeah that's true so as, as an extension of this, while he's working through it, it kind of comes to this conclusion that, oh, it's a sort of religious mania in his terms, in his terms uh, which is driving her onward. He has this moment of almost revelation in, in which he sees that she's got a Bible and he falls down to his knees and begins to kiss her feet, uh, which I, I think is kind of an allusion to, you know, obviously the, the washing of feet in the Bible being a very intimate act, especially of Jesus washing the disciples' feet of this, the imagery of the Son of God washing the feet of of, of mere humans and being that that being posed as like imagery which is is not just like humbling but also like rightfully so like there's a this, there this relationship is not one way however because it's Raskolnikov and he's just randomly started kissing this woman's feet out of nowhere she freaks out very understandably well he is he does also i think he does talk he does consider opening an only fans around this part of the book <laughs> <laughs> he has his own only fans are trying to like find the the feet the feet part of the of this website i guess he's like a producer i don't know okay right yeah stop prodding into my joke i just wanted it to be a one-liner <laughs> and then we can go back to the show <laughs> i don't want to work out the logistics let's let's investigate the logistics of risk in the cops <laughs> well see he's got all that fat financing from razumikin but he doesn't want to do publishing that's true that's true i mean he it, he does he is remarkably handsome right i mean we can only assume that's so probably true hot. for the feet too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I would I would bet that we're probably the only podcast uh, or like internet video which covers uh, crime and punishment which has used the phrase "Where Skolnikov is hot" multiple times. And maybe the others are right in that they don't do that. Yeah, I don't know. We should probably get going, otherwise the network's going to take us off the air. Oh, yeah. Just nose in the pages. Just the counter just ticked <laughs> up one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he is down down on his knees, like, please read read to me from the Bible. Can you read me the story of Lazarus? And this is kind of a, a moment of tension between the two, because it's obvious that Sonia, as, as you may have noted through either reading or listening, that she is quite timid. She just is, she's got her bubble of, of safe places, and inter- interacting with other people broadly is not in that place where she feels comfortable. And in fact, this is even more personal to her because uh, she's really only read the Bible, she notes, with Lizaveta, with uh, Aliona Ivanovna's sister, uh, who uh, we should note Raskolnikov murdered with an axe. Oh! That this is like, this is just the two of them. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Awkward. You just hate to accidentally axe murder your, the person who's kind of bringing you around to some kind of revelation, revelations, Bible reading mm-hmm. partner. Yeah, just really awkward. But just tough. So she only read with Lizaveta, and, and now obviously Lizaveta is dead, so she's not read with anyone. And she feels like this is her last place for herself, or at least Raskolnikov figures that that's what it is. Uh, nonetheless, he still forces her into reading, and she reads him the story of Lazarus, uh, which is largely just quoting from the Bible as in describing their reactions to each other. Uh, after they finish reading, Raskolnikov tells her that he's abandoned his family, which she's shocked at, and proposes that the two of them run away together. In response to this, um, Sonia, quote, looked at him and understood nothing. She knew only that he was terribly, infinitely unhappy. Uh, and, and basically listens to him and his propo- extended proposal on how they could run away and, and go elsewhere, but doesn't really agree to anything. And realizing that he's not really getting anywhere, Raskolnikov says, look, I'll come back tomorrow. And when I come back tomorrow, I, I'm going to tell you. And, I, you know, I decided for even even before uh, even before Alyona Ivanovna and Lizaveta were mysteriously murdered by someone who we definitely don't, you know, who we couldn't previously have known who it is. 
Uh, I will tell you who killed them tomorrow. And then he he leaves. Sonia is like, what could that mean? On some level, it's implied that she kind of understands, but also, like everyone else, like, I should mention, Razumikhin, part of the reason why he doesn't keep pursuing Raskolnikov is that there's like a moment where it's mentioned the two of them have like an unspoken understanding. And it, it seems to be that he kind of, the people around him are kind of coming around to understanding that he killed Alyona Ivanovna and Lizaveta, but no one's saying it. And so they kind of like, they both know and don't know at the same time. They know probably this is what happened, but without having that explicit conversation, they aren't explicitly mentioning it in the book, although they seem to have that understanding. And speaking of explicitly mentioning the murder, Raskolnikov then goes the next morning to go talk to Porfiry Petrovich, uh, Rosemikin's cousin and the the lawyer who very had very much prodded on Raskolnikov about these events. This section is, is quite long and it involves a lot of talking. And I'm not going to go too much into detail um, because I think in many ways it's really kind of a mind game that Porfiry is playing with uh, Raskolnikov and that when he goes to confess, and he is intending to confess here, um, well, it's not entirely clear who this, whether what he's intending, but that is basically what almost ends up happening. Uh, he has to wait for a long time to even see Porfiry. Porfiry is just having a conversation with him about anything and everything, about how these studies even happen, how he gets people to admit the truth to him. And when I, when I say it's really long, it, it really kind of feels like he's just going on at length in a way that's really distracting. But in the middle of it, he will basically say, you know, in criminals, they act this way because of X, Y, Z. And he's essentially just laying out Raskolnikov's behavior back to him before he says, no, 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 but I'm not applying this to you. You're not a suspect at all. But, you know, can you believe that some people actually act this way before he describes again how Raskolnikov is acting, kind of playing this mind game. It gets up to the point where Raskolnikov is getting more and more incensed and, and it gets to the point where Porfiry is like, oh, I've got an interesting piece of evidence for you and pulls out a key. And Raskolnikov is like jumping out of his chair to get it from him. And he's on the border borderline of confessing and, and uh, simultaneously confessing and not confessing before suddenly the doors to Porfiry's office get thrown open and the, the, the other clerks come in and Porfiry says, Hey, wait, you're not supposed to come in yet. And, and then Nikolai, if you remember, Nikolai was accused of the murder and he's, he's the painter that was accused of it because he had a, a set of earrings that Raskolnikov, Raskolnikov had dropped in the, the apartment next door that uh, Nikolai had been painting. And, he, and Nikolai says, I confess, I did it. I, I was the one who murdered Alyona Ivanovna. And uh, Porfiry is like, what? Very confused. When, when, when Nikolai first says, I did it, I killed them, Porfiry says, what, who did you kill? And, uh, you know, and now that, now that Nikolai has confessed, they take, take him in, and, and Porfiry is like, oh, I guess I go to talk to him. Weird that, like, oh, sorry about that. It was kind of a weird freakout moment. And Raskolnikov's like, yeah, haha. Yeah, I, sorry about that. I don't even know what came over me. Obviously, it couldn't be fear of being found that I'm a murderer because Nikolai is the murderer. And Porfiry is like, yeah, yeah, that definitely is definitely the case. Haha, <laughs> that would be weird. Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, sorry about that. that. was kind of an awkward situation, I guess. Um, let's chat later, I suppose. And uh, th- then goes off to presumably interrogate uh, Nikolai or ask someone what the hell happened uh, because he was very much on the borderline of getting Raskolnikov to confess. And w- which leaves us with... Uh, 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 Raskolnikov walking out uh, and, and, and essentially seeing when when he went to go to back to Eliona Ivanovna's place and she kind of basically he confesses in front of all those people. Um, it, it, if you'll recall that he, there's someone who kind of chases after him and in a later point says, you're a murderer. This guy comes back and says, hey, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were a murderer. I, I told the police about you. But obviously now that this other random guy confessed, you can't be possible. It can't possibly be you. So sorry about that. And Raskolnikov's like, yeah, well, may God forgive your mistake. And then Raskolnikov walks off and says, now we'll make a fight out of it, he said with a malicious smile as he went down the stairs. His malice was aimed at himself. With shame and contempt, he recalled his cowardice. And that's where we leave chapter five of part four of Crime and Punishment. Cameron, that was a wonderful summary. Thank you. And I have to ask you one thing as I bring you over to the Crystal Palace. (laughs) What's that? And I walk over, as you'll recall, we were talking about things that I hate burning. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Number one thing that I hate burning, absolute worst thing, is burning my pies in the oven. Mm. But the one type mm-hmm. of pie that you can't burn is lingo pie. Lingo pie is the world's only language learning application that uses real TV shows and movies to help you learn a language. They use real TV shows and movies from the language that you want to learn. Each TV show comes with subtitles in the original language, and every word is clickable to give you an instant translation in real time to help you learn. LingoPie is great for all levels from beginner to advanced, with great content and language learning tools appropriate for everyone. Head on over to learn.lingopie.com slash tipsytolstoy. 
uh, to, to check it out, to learn a, bit, a little bit more. See if you want to sign up, maybe, perhaps. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you are maybe not of the language and learning persuasion, but do like reading a lot, uh, Libro.fn may be in your interest then. Libro.fm makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks through your local bookstore. How? Well, whether you're paying for a monthly membership, giving an audiobook gift to a friend, or buying audiobooks for yourself or your organization, Libro.fm splits the profit from your purchases with your local bookstore. They've got many of the books we read readily available on their site, including, notably, Crime and Punishment. Check the show notes for more information on those links. All right, phew. I'm going back to our uncompromised analysis. <laughs> The, the, the outro makes less sense now that we call it the, the Crystal Palace, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, corporate it's looking over our shoulders like hawks. All right. Well, now we can get back to our crystal clear analysis. <laughs> oh, I like that one. Boom. Just <laughs> ad-libbing out of here. <laughs> Absolute ad-libbing. All we ever do. So speaking of ad-libbing, uh, Raskolnikov's, uh, Raskolnikov's day of uh, attempted ad- admitting to his crime and... Mm-hmm. You really hate when you think you're tying all, all your affairs up before you confess to your big crime and it's all undone by some rando confessing to, to, to your your crime. Yeah, you do hate that. Though I will say that is kind of the premise of mm, what feels like every part we've read so far is Rakon- Riskon- <laughs> Riskolnikov going like, all right, boys, today we're going to do it. Today we're going to tell him. <laughs> and then something derails him along the way. Uh, yeah. I would have to look back even at like how many days we've been through in this book because we've been reading it over a couple of weeks. So it, it you know, kind of time feels meaningless, if you will. But I right. really don't think it's been that long. No, I think it's only been it's probably been a week, maybe two weeks at most. Yeah, because it's what not it only like, said yeah. how long. Yeah, it's not said how long that he's in that kind of fugue state. But I feel, I feel like it's three or four days, maybe depending on based on just like a rough back of napkin mental math on mm-hmm. on how many times they reference nighttime or you like sleeping all day. It, it really has not been very long, which doesn't feel like that because we're almost 400 pages in. I also think that this um, this part in particular is kind of funny. It, it was like something I was, I was reading and I was like, oh, my God, this is essentially the 19th century version of my least favorite modern sitcom premise, <laughs> which is the gossip based misunderstanding in which mm. one character says something to another that completely informs their worldview about another character, and that sets the scene for this like irreparable conflict where neither of them will like say anything to each other about it. <laughs> because this part is just <laughs> all about gossip. It's literally yeah. the gossip part. <laughs> it's just go- gossiping from one character to the next. Yeah, part three was like hot family summer, and then part four is gossip autumn basically <laughs> right even more gossip I, I forgot to mention i just realized i forgot to mention this so at the end of uh Raskolnikov's conversation with sonia uh it's it's noted early on that there is a another room next to hers which is there's a door but it's not been rented in quite a long time at the very end of it it's revealed that it was formerly rented to a madame reslich who you might recognize as the aunt of the girl that Svidrig i love abused uh, and he is in that room having recently rented it and he's standing at the door listening and even brings a chair over there. So it's like, ah, oh, next time they come over, I want to make sure I can listen in comfort. <laughs> I hated that so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is what you might call in relation from, um, Reslich, uh, um, uh, niece and, uh, Dunya and now Sonia, uh, what you might call a pattern of abuse. But I guess I don't need to convince you that Svidrigailov's a bad Svidrigailov's a bad person. So you don't. No, you really don't. <laughs> I I don't know if this is the case. I feel like somebody smarter than me should, you know, chime in here on this. But it is interesting that both Sonia and Svidrigailov seem to like be seeing ghosts now. I mean, Svidrigailov. It's noted that it has been going on for a while after his wife dies. But I'm kind of wondering if. When Sonia's like, oh, I I thought I saw my father walking down the street. Like, does Fidrick I love look like her father? And she just thinks that now that he's living next to her, she looks... Er, it, now that he's living next to Sonia, that he looks like Sonia's father? Do you think that's the case? <laughs> Part of it might just be... I, I don't know if, if this is meant to be connected, but, like, Svidrick I love is having full-blown conversations with his with his dead wife. And the thing is that it's never, and maybe this would be the case, if because, again, we do not have a perspective on Marfa. We only know her through uh, Pulcheria and through Svidrigailov, so we don't have a perspective on her herself. But 
Svidrigailov's version of his wife is just kind of like just there being like, oh, what do you think of my new dress? And him having conversations like, oh, I think I'm going to marry again soon. And her being like, ah, you cheeky, alive husband of mine. You aren't even going to wait until I'm cold on <laughs> the ground before you remarry. Ha ha ha. Whereas uh, Sonia's is much more of a, I thought I saw my father on the street, which is just like, I, you know, I, I feel like sometimes I'm walking down the street. I think I see my sister um, just randomly, you know, someone who we haven't seen in a long time. And you're just like weird association. I think feel like hers is much more understandable and much more indicative of grief, which maybe draws the line between the two of them having the same experience. But one obviously being tailored around Svidrikai loves his ego that his dead wife would come back to talk to him, but only about fair. things that are just like th- that are not disturbing to him, you know, never like, Hey, so about all those crimes I covered up for you. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. But I feel like no one's really talking about this. What if Svidrigalov actually is a ghost <laughs> and he's just like written so realistically that everyone thinks he's there. <laughs> you know, you don't know. Svidrigalov, you Svidrigalov, don't know. Uh, <laughs> he posits that ghosts are real and you and we don't know because he, he's like some people say that only sick men see them and that's indicative of the fact that it's a hallucination but really maybe the fact that sick men only see ghosts is an indication that sick men are closer to the world of the ethereal and therefore they are more likely to see you know ghosts from the world that they no longer have a world that they have a strong attachment on and if you told me that Svedrick Adler was a deeply sick man who didn't have a strong attachment to the material <laughs> world I would believe you in a heartbeat yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> He kind of does put forward an interesting, well, interesting. It sounds bad when you say it that way when you contextualize it. <laughs> he puts forward an argument that I feel like is central to a lot of the conflict in the book, which mm. we talked about with Katya Bowers a little bit in part one, which is the difference between ideas and action. Uh, when does an idea actually become action? And when can you kind of mm. draw that line? Uh, and, and he's he's kind of talking a little bit about his wife and, and saying, no, like, it, you know, she had a, a bottle of wine after a heavy dinner, which, as we know, that totally kills people all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's killed me several times personally. Uh, <laughs> and, and he says, well, you know, I guess I could have contributed to this whole moral calamity uh, or I could have contributed to this whole calamity morally in a way. Mm. Um. I don't think it's totally psychological what he's implying here at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, considering he admits to physically beating her like not that long after or not that far before. Um, but it is an, an interesting question that I feel like this chapter is dealing with because it's a very psychological, moral chapter where people don't really do a lot. It's just what can you influence someone to do based on conversation? Right. That's what was interesting about this part to me. I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think there's an interesting parallel to be drawn, not like beyond, there's that, but there are also the parallels to be drawn between uh, Svidrigailov and Raskolnikov in the sense that, so there's this there's this line, I, honestly, I wish I'd written it down, but I, I don't remember who he's talking to, but it's noted that at some point that Unbelievable. Raskolnikov is... <laughs> Shut <laughs> no. the podcast down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I think it's when he's talking to Sonia, and it's mentioned that he's considering her situation, but he's con- he, but he's young, and he's considering it abstractly, and because he's his analysis is, is abstract, it's thereby, uh, it, it was thereby uh, brutal or cruel, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the one of the things you're, when I, why I draw the line between Raskolnikov and Svidrigailov is that Svidrigailov has a completely abstract analysis of the world that he, he comes to Raskolnikov and says like, hey, I know it looks bad that I tried to force your sister into a relationship and it looks bad that I beat my wife and then she died. But if you think about it from a larger perspective, you know, like I, you can't control who you fall in love with. So really, I'm a victim of that whole situation because <laughs> I just happen to fall in love with your sister. And the way I expressed it was just, you know, I, obviously hard on her. But, you know, we're both victims, really. Sure. No one could be said to be a bad guy. I uh, mean, you know, like he's talking about beating his wife. He's like, you know, I think, you know, it was barely a couple lashes. And, you know, I think even she could agree that a couple of the times it was well deserved. He's got a completely abstracted version of, of life. This, I, I hesitate to call it a rationalist, but he it really is like a view of life, which is more strongly based in an intellectualization rather than of actually living it. Human emotions don't come into it at all. It's about his how he views them. And you can see that, too, in Raskolnikov and the way he talks about he's talking to Sonia and he tries to abstract her life um, and he tries to basically put his own life on it. uh, And in taking that abstraction is like his solution to it it, as it is in his own life is like basically, wow, you should kill yourself. Um, 
but that's also in at odds with the fact that he's fundamentally as he's growing to be over the course of like this couple of days a very empathetic person which mm-hmm. is i think kind of in many ways posed as like the polar opposite of this kind of abstract um analysis uh, abstract way of approaching life where like really approaching someone one-on-one like we open up with him trying to analyze her life and being like this sucks i don't see why you go at all and by the end you're kind of at he's not t- approaching a reason-based view at all he's just looking at the fact that she reads that she's got a strong re- what he calls religious mania or he calls he calls religious mania he calls madness he's really not complimentary in his language but he's like wow that's amazing that's it it speaks to him in many ways and that's what kind of pulls him down to a form of reality so i think in some ways you're kind of seeing again some dialogue indirectly between like a view of life which is fundamentally abstract and a view of life which is irrational uh but very personal yeah the can you kind of me think of the to jump around a little bit here the scene between raskolnikov and porfiry kind of in the middle i guess of it uh, where they're kind of just mentally sparring with each other. And Porfiry says, the, the general case, the case for which all legal forms and rules are intended, for which they are calculated and laid down in books, does not exist at all. For the reason that every case, every crime, for instance, as soon as it actually occurs, at once becomes a thoroughly special case, and sometimes a case unlike any other that's gone before. It's just, it, it is interesting because of the amount of times that the characters, like you were saying, kind of do tend to abstract and try and apply and kind of do all these things that in a lot of ways you're supposed to do inclined to do taught to do in some cases and it's just kind of interesting to see how they how they work out which generally isn't you know isn't great (laughs) um and i guess in the case for porfiry and raskolnikov obviously he's this is certainly a little bit different than what svidrigalov is talking about but it Mm. is the exactly the same thing that we were talking about happened when Raskolnikov actually went to commit the crime, which is no matter how much you plan to do something, whether a crime or not, it is quite likely that it will not actually happen the way that you planned it to do. Uh, just mm. because there are there is some element of chance that will make kind of every individual second of that uh, different than you could potentially plan for it. Or it has it has the chance to it has a chance to kind of get out of control or be unpredictable, mm. and that's yeah. not just on the crime level, but that's on every level really in this book, <laughs> like a social level as well, which is kind of fun to dissect. Yeah, even on a narrative level, even when Porfiry thinks, "Oh, my plans worked. I've got Raskolnikov right where I want him," and Raskolnikov is like, "Damn right you do. Yep. I committed the crime." <laughs> <laughs> Nikolai bursts in and thoroughly disrupts both of them <laughs> in what yeah. should be the most straightforward <laughs> I think you did a crime yeah you think that because I did it kind of <laughs> dialogue I know and then Dostoevsky's like alright now you're gonna read several more parts and an epilogue how about that <laughs> <laughs> I mean would it be Russian literature if, if we got to 400 pages and there was like yeah that seems like enough uh, let's let's wrap it up here nope we're gonna go for like we're gonna go for like a mid 500s how about that <laughs> I will say uh, something I've been thinking about since I read this part. There is probably one of my favorite books that I've ever read is In the Lake of the Woods, which I don't think I've talked about in the podcast before, but I definitely have written about it. Um, And it's basically about this guy who he's a Vietnam vet who's running for governor in Maine. And it comes out halfway through the campaign that he was involved in the My Lai massacre. And if you don't know what My Lai is, I'll I'll link it. I'm not going to go into it too much here, but. So uh, you should know about it if you're if you're an American, um, or even if you're not. But really, you, if you're an American, you really should. So he's involved in the Milai massacre, and when he escapes from that, he goes out to a cabin with his wife to basically get away from the media coverage. And while they're there, his wife disappears. Uh, d- d- the question is, did he kill his wife? Did she run off? Did she abandon him? What happened there? Um, and the point of the book is not actually that mystery at all in fact it's really more about him than it is about anything else because it goes in this the structure of okay uh let's talk about what theoretically could have happened and the narrator is not uh, like the narrator is almost written like it's a journalist like here's what i think happens you've got narration what probably happened what may have happened an a, an episode which is or like a chapter which is called a an evidence chapter which is just quotations or things found in the house afterwards and then finally you get the third act which is a bit of a piece of his, of his history and it, it keeps going in three act structures of okay Here's what I think happened. Here's some evidence. Here's a piece from his past. 
now learning that here's what I think happened now. And like within 40 pages that the guy writing it is the theoretical narrator is like, I don't really know what the, the ending is going to be. I, I don't know what happened to him. This is the part where fiction fails because I can't tell you what the truth is. I can merely give you an ordering of facts that make sense to me. Um, and the book ends on a, on, on a, just a very ambiguous note where it's really not clear what happened. And it says, you know, can we accept that he was not a monster, but a man that he was innocent of everything, but his life. Now, this book is really an interrogation of like the way we hide ourselves from the people around us. And frankly, we even hide ourselves from ourselves. And that being said, that that's a view that has been really impactful in my life. But it's also something that I will say Dostoevsky does challenge quite a bit in this bit in this book that I, I, I've been thinking about quite a lot, probably most directly in the part where uh, Svidrigailov is like, hey, you know, I'm not really a monster. I'm nothing but a man. Um, and, and everything that has happened is because of uh, the passions of a human, of like the, the, the wants and feelings of a human. And in and, and many ways, uh, this is like not really an analysis of the book, but it is something that it's been sitting with me and that my own um he's admittedly like very postmodernist view on human nature and, and and ourselves is like on many levels i really don't agree with dostoevsky but it's hard to get away from i think dostoevsky's very incisive views of you know i think if were he to come back today everyone would be like this guy's very regressive but not regressive without some amount of incisiveness in his critis- criticism of the ideologies which have largely come before in you know after his death or even somewhat in his own time mm-hmm. not a direct not a direct thing on the book just just something that i, I dostoevsky i'm always like i really fundamentally and, and ideologically i'm really not aligned with dostoevsky but i can't i can't tell you that he's not a very good critic man got some points that's all we gotta say <laughs> <laughs> um I, before we get going there is one last thing i kind of wanted to end on which is um, so over the course of the book, the book really starts off with the, the narrator, I should say, is not the same as Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov is not the narrator of the book, although in the first couple of parts, you may come to that conclusion because it is almost entirely from his point of view. And one thing that did strike me about part four, and this is not, this does not start in part four, but it really gets a lot stronger, is that the narrator who does provide independent commentary and follows other characters becomes much more to the fore here, which I think is interesting. Um... Because as as so, I read uh, an article for this, which we actually didn't really have much of a chance to bring up. Uh, but I, I would encourage people to read it. I will link it in the show notes. It's called "Sonia Silent No More: A Response to the Woman Question in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment" by Elizabeth Blake. And uh, one of the points that Blake's makes uh, in the article is that the perspective of women, as we kind of lampshaded in talking about Marfa Marfa's presence, not as Marfa, but as the view of Marfa that others around her have is very much dictated by the men around them in Dostoevsky's book. It's, it's very it's a very traditional, somewhat patriarchal perspective on it. Um, no, no, for Dostoevsky, that's not that unique. That is kind of that's also kind of how Dostoevsky approaches all of his characters in a certain in a certain way of looking at it. But I think there's something to to point out. And, and as Blake notes that Dostoevsky in his own life was affected by many of the women he met in a personal and professional context that probably challenged him on that. Um, if we're getting to this point where even sometimes the people around him, although they are, the narrator often does present them to us almost exclusively through Raskolnikov's perspective, they do get, they are starting to get more of a life outside of Raskolnikov or even like at the start of the book, even Raskolnikov's own mother is really, and, and sister are interpreted through Raskolnikov for us. Now we're coming to part four and we have Raskolnikov and, uh, Sonia talking. And in many ways you start to see the narrator leaving Raskolnikov and in many ways sitting with Sonia Barso in this chapter where he's going off and towards the end about how they should leave it all behind and, and flee to another place and it could just be them and we aren't sitting with him at all we aren't seeing his internal monologue like we would in, in other parts like we have earlier we're sitting with Sonia who's looking at him and says like, I really don't understand what's going on here but I understand this is a man who is just deeply infinitely sad uh, which I think this is interesting that we're starting to see a greater movement of of the of the narrator sitting either as an independent figure somewhat or even sitting with other characters like when we follow Illusion for a while, for example, or following Svidrigailov more so than we have in, in previous parts, which is just, I think, something to pay attention to if you're reading along. Yeah, you're starting to get the characters that are not centrally located, I guess, in a lot of ways. Like, and we talked about how Razumikin was kind of the, the core, somebody who is connected to a lot of the people in the book, and you're starting to get people outside of that now. And it renders some interesting judgment at times, or narration at times, if you will. 
which is yeah it's it's quite it's quite um, like um like uh, Koch Bauer said that this is really a it's not a it's not a who done it's not a how done it's a it's a why done it and now we're getting beyond just like the why done it on the individual level but the why done it from the outside in perspective which is which is really interesting to see and also the why can't i confess to my own crime done it you know <laughs> good it's good uh i feel like at the at the very end i will say with with porphyry i feel like i was i, I felt like i was watching an episode of columbo <laughs> a little bit <laughs> um but that's neither here nor there <laughs> good good okay well that has been part four of crime and punishment cameron i gotta know after mm. part four on a scale from one to yeltsin because we have been neglecting mm. the scale recently i realize oh, yes. but i must yep return us to it how drunk are you okay so like i said at the top of the episode i've got i had i had a beer a barley wine which if you know much about barley wines are fairly high abv uh this one is where did i put it uh, okay only only 10 percent uh in addition oh my to my coffee and whiskey consumption fairly up there as you might have mm-hmm. guessed from the large uh, uh digression into talking about uh tim o'brien like i always do um uh, definitely at probably a six or a seven i would say how about you yeah i'm probably uh se- seven or eight because i um I, ha- I had some drinks before uh actually coming out and recording the podcast which is how the podcast should always be recorded <laughs> yeah my, mis- my my mistake is i always start drinking we, we always get into we start recording and i'm like oh shoot i've got to quickly shoot something um and that, that's always i really should be preparing like you yeah yeah uh slowly and deliberately <laughs> you gotta have it you gotta have a you gotta have a strict routine 15 minutes beforehand you gotta have at least three five percent beers you, you turn on football you slam them you ice yourself and then you sit down and get ready to podcast this is what it's called this is what being a professional is all about routine you missed the part where i yell go sports <laughs> on my tv which is currently off correct <laughs> <laughs> what am i gonna do watch sports on it no <laughs> Yeah. All right. um, <laughs> <laughs> and then outro goes here. Okay. Cool. Nice. <laughs>